Multiple sclerosis is a central nervous system autoimmune disease that can present with a broad range of symptoms, ranging from pain, eye troubles, whole body fatigue, weakness, loss of coordination, and on and on. It is a feared autoimmune disease because of the way that it can ravage you both mentally and from a whole body perspective. Today I want to talk about triggering factors that are treatment targets for clinicians who are taking a whole body approach on people suffering from multiple sclerosis. There's more than just your brain involved in terms of triggering factors and factors that can exacerbate and flare disease. And if you don't understand that, you won't live your best life with multiple sclerosis and you won't have any chance of potentially reversing it or dampening it to the point where you could live in a way that you don't even know it's there. Let's dive in. I'm Dr. John Bartimus, and I'm putting the pieces together to help you live a life at Optimal. Multiple sclerosis is a broad ranging, systemic, impacting central nervous system autoimmune disease. It is diagnosed using what's called the McDonald criteria, which wants to see lesions disseminated in both location and in time on MRI. This can make diagnosis of multiple sclerosis a little tricky in the early stages because a person may have MS symptoms before the M there's enough damage to show up on MRI. And so a person could be suffering long before they get the diagnosis and therefore the treatment in the conventional medical model because they're not going to treat for it before they diagnose it. Now, before you can have multiple lesions over time, meaning you're going to have multiple lesions on an MRI multiple times to then fit diagnostic criteria, you could have what's called clinically isolated syndrome or CIS. This is the first presentation of symptoms that appear to be MS, but it can't be diagnosed MS because you don't have that dissemination in time factor yet or multiple MRIs showing lesions over time. So the person suffering from CIS or early MS symptoms that do not yet fit diagnostic criteria continues to degenerate or to suffer while they're waiting to fit the criteria. Now, you may also have signs of the autoimmune process before you have symptoms in the form of antibodies to myelin basic protein or MBP antibodies or myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, MOG antibodies. These help us because if you're a person that is suffering from what appears to be MS but don't yet fit diagnostic criteria but have the antibodies, we can see that the autoimmune process is present that may result in MS. And so you should then at that time start taking action to address whatever is involved in your case physiologically as a trigger or promoter of multiple sclerosis. What could those triggering factors be? Well, there are many, and that's what we want to cover in this video so that you're aware of them and you can start taking action to address them if they're present in your specific case. So the first one is geographic location. So where you're located geographically matters because at different parts of the world there is different sun exposure which is an associated factor here. So your geographic location and your sun exposure matter because the more sun you get, the better your vitamin D3 level. And the better your vitamin D3 level, the more immune modulation you have and anti-inflammatory aspects you have to prevent that development of multiple sclerosis. So location, sun exposure, and therefore vitamin D are very important. Your levels of melatonin are important in multiple sclerosis. Because of the role melatonin plays in immune system modulation, 
melatonin promotes a, a, the immune system to be a phenotype or a, an expression that is anti-MS. So we'll keep it there just to keep it um, 101 course level today, okay? Um, diet is a big factor, believe it or not, surprise, in risk for multiple sclerosis as it is in all autoimmune diseases and pretty much all disease in general. Now diet can play a supportive role or a preventative role and it can play a triggering role or exacerbation role. From a positive standpoint, diet plays a role based on your level of fish consumption, assuming that it's wild caught and as low toxin, low heavy metals as possible your fish oil consumption and omega-3 levels, and your tryptophan consumption. All of those things have been shown to be protective and beneficial to prevent MS. Now, the negative aspects of diet are many. Many foods have been shown to be cross-reactive with MBP or MOG antibodies or what are also called aquaporin 4 antibodies. So foods that are shown to be cross-reactive in multiple sclerosis are milk, corn, soy, tomato, spinach. So you may see on that list there's some foods that everyone in the world would agree are healthy like tomatoes and spinach. Well to the individual they may be cross-reacting and promoting, triggering, or exacerbating disease. So you have to work with someone who can figure out in you specifically is that at play in your MS. Also, the standard American diet is a known trigger for disease in general. So things like gluten and omega-6 oils and processed foods and those things all need to be avoided, of course. And then also salt needs to be avoided. Why salt? Well, salt has been shown in recent research that it promotes Th17 cells, and Th17 cells are the cells of the immune system that promote the tissue damage and autoimmune disease. And specific to multiple sclerosis, Th17 cells are the most commonly found culprit in the research in terms of immune dysfunction that's involved in MS. So if you are wary that you have MS or you have the diagnosis, you want to watch your salt intake. <clears throat> And it doesn't matter what kind of salt. It could be pink Himalayan salt blessed by a shaman. It doesn't matter. Sodium chloride is sodium chloride. Salt is salt. So that's diet. Now the next triggering factor is the gut microbiome. And if you're reading any health news at all, you see that the gut microbiome is being found day in and day out by the research to be involved in just about everything. So I'm not going to go extensively into that today because I've done many videos on this in the past. Just suffice it to say that the gut microbiome matters because up to 70% of your immune system is in your gut. If you have dysbiosis or leaky gut or GI infection, that's going to swing potentially the immune system phenotype toward a pro-inflammatory, pro-autoimmune bias and you're off to the races. Environmental pollutants are another risk factor for MS. So these are things like pesticides, herbicides, plasticizers, BPA, um, uh, heavy metals. All of these things in our environment can promote in the right or wrong person the triggering of the disease process. So in every MS case, is an herbicide the cause? No. But if you're the unlucky person that's susceptible to that sort of thing, then it may be the cause in you. So these are things we need to address. A, because they cause immune dysfunction. B, because they can cause hormonal imbalances and systemic inflammation, etc. Next is cigarette smoke. And that doesn't take too much... Uh, we don't have to cover that much because everyone knows cigarette smoking is bad for you. There's not a shred of evidence on the planet that it's good for you. So if you're smoking, you gotta stop. All right, next, 
Histamine can be a triggering factor for multiple sclerosis. How does that work? Well, histamine can swing the immune system towards an immune phenotype that drives central nervous system autoimmunity. Histamine increases blood-brain barrier permeability. So if you have leaky brain, immune system cells from the body can now infiltrate and enter the brain. And research shows that the more brain infiltration we have from our peripheral or body immune system, the more severe the MS. So body inflammation leads to brain inflammation and brain inflammation increases risk of brain autoimmunity. So if you have high histamine or a histamine disorder, it may be driving leaky brain or blood brain barrier permeability in you, allowing immune cells into the brain that shouldn't be there. Now there's inflammation and brain tissue damage. And now we're presenting that to our T cells and the T cells might start recognizing brain as enemy. And now we have brain autoimmunity. So we don't want to have histamine imbalances. Next, viral infections. So if we have viral infections, there's multiple viruses that have been specifically associated with multiple sclerosis. Those include Epstein-Barr virus. So if you've ever had mono in your history, that could be a player. Uh, human herpes virus 6, measles, multiple viruses have been involved. So we don't want pathogen burden long term that's clinically relevant. Okay, and piggybacking on that is bacterial infection. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a gram-negative bacteria that has been associated with multiple sclerosis, um, as has actinobacter. So there's various bacterial triggers for multiple sclerosis. And again, that piggybacks on the viruses and the concept of total pathogen load. If we have an immune system that cannot get on top of our infections and squash them, then we have persistent or chronic infection, which leads to persistent damage to tissue, persistent inflammation, and increased risk that your immune system is going to start recognizing self as enemy, and now we have multiple sclerosis or some other autoimmune disease. And then next we want to go to dopamine. Research has shown that dopamine can promote severity in autoimmune disease because dopamine promotes Th17 cells. So uh, this one is a, little bit, is a little bit different because dopamine, obviously we need it. Dopamine is our, our feel-good brain reward cascade neurotransmitter. Anything that feels good and you say, I want more of that, that's dopamine. So um, we, we have to be careful of too much dopamine if we're in uh, a state where we have MS, especially if you're in a flare, okay? And so the last arrow we'll put here is all other systemic inflammatory drivers. So we don't have video long enough to cover every single thing that could cause systemic inflammation, but the research is clear that unequivocally systemic inflammation or body inflammation directly promotes MS and MS flares. So in a susceptible individual, if your body's on fire and you're promoting leaky brain and then the brain becomes on fire, your risk for MS goes way up. If you have MS already, any inflammation you have in the body can promote or perpetuate or flare that brain inflammation and that MS process. So this is where we have to take that whole body, whole person approach, that functional approach to your MS or your autoimmune disease because every little thing has the potential to matter. We don't want to just see the neurologist and get on the MS drugs and ignore our terrible diet or ignore our persistent chronic infections or ignore our environmental pollutant exposure. We have to address all of those things to reach that life at optimal or reach that, that optimal health in the person with MS who even if we can't erase it, say, we can reach optimal or best quality of life possible, least amount of symptoms possible, least amount of relapses possible. So whole body matters, all inflammatory drivers matter, 
all your choices, your whole lifestyle, your whole environmental exposure matters. So I hope this video opened up your eyes as to, hey, if you already have an MS diagnosis, well, there's lots you can do. You're not, you're not damned to feel as terribly as you do right now if you haven't already optimized all this. There's plenty you can work on. If you're someone that thinks you may have MS but you don't yet fit diagnostic criteria, again, these are all areas that you should investigate in yourself, partner with a clinician to investigate in yourself, and clean up before you're bad enough to meet diagnostic criteria and you could potentially never have MS. So a functional medicine clinician is the detective you need to partner with to help you tease out all these areas in your specific puzzle so that you can correct them and live a life at optimal.